Hey, good morning. Welcome to Grace Point Church. I am so glad that you are taking time to log in and uh, uh, be a part of what we're doing at Grace Point Church. Hey, I want to uh, just tell you, first of all, thank you for letting us be gone. We were gone for a couple of weeks, uh, actually just two Sundays, really gone a week. Uh, Tamara and I had the opportunity to get out of town for a little bit. And uh, anyway, I'm so thankful to Adam and so thankful to Brent that they were able to cover uh, the speaking over the last couple of weeks. But I'm excited to be with you today. Again, after some good needed, much needed rest, good needed, much needed rest, uh, excited to be here today. Hey, do me a favor while you're there sitting at your computer, your phone, wherever it is that you are watching this, uh, let us know that you're here. Uh, just type in the chat, so glad to be here this morning. Uh, let us know, wahoo, a high five, whatever it is, and uh, uh, let us know that you are a part of what was going on. Well, I want to jump right into the message this morning. I'm excited uh, for, for this word today. And if you would do me a favor, uh, either open up your YouVersion Bible app. You can follow the notes along there as well. But looking in there, uh, Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. We'll kick it off right there. And this is what it says. Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers. They were Simon, his other name was Peter, and Andrew, his brother. And they were putting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, he said, follow me, and I will make you fish for men. At once they left their nets, and they followed him. So God, I thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. Father God, I'm thankful that we can worship you and be a part of this. So God, I pray that this message, Lord, as we talk about what it is to follow you, would speak to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hey, what a crazy story, right? Okay, so you've got these guys, they're in a boat, they're fishing, and all of a sudden Jesus walks up to him and says, hey guys, why don't you quit what you're doing, whatever it is, and why don't you come and follow me? And they immediately responded. They immediately responded to this. And I was kind of thinking a little bit about this because there's a little history too about how, uh, how um, young Jewish boys were viewed, especially as when they were kids, and as they would grow up. So you need to understand that there was a, a saying that would go around and they would say, hey, may the dust of your rabbi be on you. May the dust of your rabbi be on you. And basically what that was, was meant to be was that as they followed as a rabbi, a known rabbi, he was a known teacher, he was of, of good reputation, and he would have a group that would go with him as he traveled from the synagogue to synagogue or place to place, wherever it was he was going. He would have a group and there would be um, like young people that would follow him, that would be learning from him, that he would teach. And so what they would say, so like when they would say, hey, may the dust of your rabbi be upon you is actually a compliment. Hey, may you be learning the ways of God. May you be learning what it's about. And how these boys were chosen to be a part of this rabbi's uh, group or to be in his study, uh, his understudy, so to speak, um, they would be, as young Jewish boys, they would be given tests, and they would have to do certain things. And, and so, and as they would progress through these tests, would, it was basically, I guess, like a weed out process, right? It would just be one of those things where, hey, um, you've got it. So what they would do is they would start out, you need to memorize the, um, the book of the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the first five books they would have to memorize word for word and know it inside and out. And if you were unable to do that, then obviously you were kind of maybe taken out. You were not, hey, you know what? You don't have it. And so those would be somewhat of the best of the best. And then they would have other things that they would do. And so it was somewhat of a weed out. So again, when a Jewish boy was being raised, it was that thing, may the dust of your rabbi be upon you. And if you didn't make that grade or you didn't make it to that point, you were asked to, hey, you know what, this isn't for you, then you would go and take on the family business or the family trade, whatever it is. And so you have these, these guys that are fishing, all right, going back to the, the, the guys that were fishing, to Simon and uh, Andrew uh, as they were fishing, and they see this rabbi come up to them and says, hey, follow me. And of course, they were willing to drop what they were doing and Maybe they've heard or whatever it was, and they quit everything that they were doing. And I was thinking about this when he said, you know, hey, come and follow me. He said, follow me, and I will make you fish for men. One translation is, I'll make you fisher of men. 
And so they left. They follow me. That's what he said. And I believe what Hebrews says, the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when he says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, I believe that he's speaking that to us as well when he says, come and follow me. And that's what we're called to do, right? We're called to follow him. He still invites us. He's present day disciples. In the same way, he says, follow me. But I guess the thing of it is, is one question we sometimes fail to ask, and we rightfully should ask this question. When he says, follow me, we might ask, well, where, where is he going? <laughs> where are you going? Right? It's, it's a little bit relevant. You can ask that because I believe the destination is important. We don't want to just blindly follow. But absolutely, when it comes to Christ and what he has for us, we know the destination. So there are times, yes, we follow blindly. But our faith and our trust is in Christ. It's a risen Savior. I was thinking about the importance of this because I know that, you know, when Tamara and I met, golly, you, you know, well, we met over 30 years ago. We're getting ready to almost celebrate 30 years of marriage. But when we first met, and we might have saw some things in each other. We might have been like, oh, hey, you're for me, I'm for you, whatever it is. You know, when we first met, I didn't get on a knee, get down on one knee and propose to her, right? I mean, it wasn't that immediate because, first of all, I didn't know where she was going. She didn't know where I was going. I thought it was kind of important that we be going the same direction, that uh, we would know the destination. We'd be going that same way before we decided to get married. And once we realized we were on the same path, we realized that we are for each other and realized that, wow, we are going the same direction. Let's make this happen. And so, therefore, we got married. Well, I was thinking about this. You know, there is a, there's a chapter in the Bible that has the answer to this question of where Jesus is going. One chapter in the New Testament, found in the book of Luke, chapter 15. And I was thinking about this too, because, you know, a lot of times through Scripture, when Jesus wants to give us a, a, a truth, a spiritual truth, he'll tell us a parable. There'll be maybe one parable to go along with that, and just like, hey, he'll give us the parable and the spiritual truth, and emphasize that spiritual truth. There's a few times in the book of Matthew where he gives us more than one parable to uh, talk about a spiritual truth, a one spiritual truth. But in the book of Luke, chapter 15, he actually uses three parables. And this is the only chapter in all of the Gospels that Jesus used three parables to tell us one truth. To tell us one truth. I think that would be kind of important, right? When Jesus said, hey, this is where we're going. This is what I am doing. And so here's the truth. Luke answers the question. Three parables, exact same, with the exact truth, all right? Again, it's unusual. So here's what it says. Luke chapter 15, verse 4 says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Then he says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine uh, who need no repentance. He's excited. He's saying, which one of you, who, what one of you would not leave the ninety-nine to go find the one? The lost sheep. That's the parable of the lost sheep. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, he says, Are what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One coin, nine others are there, and she goes after the one coin. It says there's more joy in heaven, and then the third story is the story of the prodigal son, which we talked about many times. 
the prodigal son, obviously there was uh, uh, two sons and a father. And I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit because it's a little bit long if I read the whole thing to you. But what happens is obviously the, the, the one son goes to his dad and he says, Hey, dad, I don't want to wait around for you to die. I would really like my inheritance now. And so the father divides the inheritance up between the two boys. And the one boy takes his inheritance and he takes off. And he spends it on basically, um, man, just a, man, lack of a better term, he's a sinning lifestyle. He spends it in sin and he gets caught and he, he uh, uh, loses everything that he gained. And he's just thinking to himself, he goes, man, if I could just go back to my father's house and I could just be a servant, I could just be a servant in my father's house. Instead of watching the pigs eat slop and I, they're eating better than I am, I'm going to go back to my father. And the story goes on to say that the, the, the father sees his son coming from afar off and as he's walking, he's saying, man, my son who was lost is now found. Put a robe on him. Give him a ring on his finger. Put a crown on his head. For my son who I thought was dead is now alive and he's back with me. Rejoicing over that prodigal son, of the, the son who came home. And so I want to unpack this a little bit. I want to kind of look at it a little bit more as we look at these three parables. When Jesus said, come follow me, exactly what does that mean? And why are we talking about it in these parables? You see, when, when we look at this, there's three stories and they have so much in common. You see, there was a wrong place in the story. There's God in the story, and then there's the right place. So if you think about it, let's look at the lost sheep. Who was in the wrong place? It was the one sheep, right? You guys with me now? You tracking? <laughs> All right. Well, who does the shepherd represent? Obviously, that represents God in our story or in our parable. And then who were in the right place? Right? 99. The 99 sheep. You can type that in the chat. The 99. So you had the one sheep that obviously went away, that was lost, and the shepherd was willing to leave the 99 who were good. They were great. He goes, I'm going to leave you guys, and I'm going to go find the one sheep. And you would think, wow, you know, man, that's kind of a pretty diligent shepherd. I'd be kind of happy. I, I still got 99, right? He said, no, I'm going after the one. And so it's talking about our father as he comes after us. As he comes after us. What about in the story of the lost coin? What was in the wrong place? Obviously, the coin, right? And who does, who's God represented by? He's represented by the woman. And who was in the right place? It was the nine other coins. He said, these guys are good, but she's willing. She goes, you know what? I'm going after the one that's lost. I'm going after the one that I can't find. I'm going to sweep the house. I'm going to clean everything. I'm going to turn on all the lights. I'm going to make sure I find that one coin. And then the last one, the prodigal son. You know, you look at this, you, you're, you're looking at the one son was in the wrong place and the other son was in the right place. And I talk about the one in the right place. He was in the right place physically. There's a whole nother sermon series on his attitude. We won't talk about that right now. We don't got that kind of time. And then obviously the father represents God and who was waiting for his son to come home, waiting for him to come back. You see, as we talk about these, uh, these things where, where, uh, where we look at these categories and obviously God being in the center, and which are the categories was God more focused on? Which one? It was going after the lost. The shepherd's main focus is on the sheep, that which is lost. The woman's main focus is on the one coin, that which is lost. That which is lost. And the father's main focus was on his lost son, that which was lost. Because he says when he was still far away, the father saw him. You see, he was looking for him to return. He was waiting with anticipation. Today is today the day that my son returns. Is today the day he comes back. It was that prodigal son. I'm waiting for him to come back. Jesus' main focus is on that which is lost. And then on, when he's doing this, he's looking at the 99 or he's looking at us who are in the right place. We're not in the wrong place. They're looking at us in the right place. And he just looks over his shoulders and says, hey, guys, follow me. Hey, come, help me find and seek those that are lost. 
come with me, make this happen. You see, he goes, and I want to know that when we talk about who we are as Christians, that's Christianity. Brent had an incredible message last week talking about just the simpleness of the gospel and what Christ gave for us, that we're his treasure. And he says, follow me. Come on, let's go get some people. Let's go find some people. Let's go seek those that are lost. That's what we are when we take the term Christian. It says Christ follower. We're Christ followers. You see, a lot of times, you know, we, we, uh, if we're serious about following him, this is where we'll end up. Where Yes, we want to follow you. We want to go where you go. We want to uh, uh, see people come into a relationship with our Savior. We follow Christ. I think about our world today. A lot of times we put ourselves in the center. I was talking with someone earlier and we were just saying, you know what? God is the focus of the scripture. God is the focus of our world. God is the hero. And sometimes we try to make it about us when it's really about God when it's really about following Christ. You see the definition of Christianity. We're Christ's followers. We're to seek and save that's what's lost. And see, you have no idea what may happen if you really set out, man, I want to see people come to Christ. I want to see people have a relationship. You have no idea what would happen. I heard this incredible story about two boys or two men. I say boys. I guess I'm getting old. Every I don't know. But these two men, uh, they, they heard a similar, one of them heard a similar uh, a story or message like I'm talking to you today. And, and this young man, his name, was, uh, uh, his, his name was Marcus. And Marcus had uh, just this just great conviction as he walked out of a similar message like we're talking about today. And he made purpose in his heart. He says, you know what? The next person that I come in contact with, the next person that I see... I'm going to invite to be a part of a group or to come with me to church. And so he walked into a room and uh, never even met the other young man that he came in the counter with. His name was Daniel. And Marcus walked up to Daniel and invited him to small group. He says, hey, I want you to come with me to the small group. And, and, uh, and Daniel accepts. And what's kind of funny about this is that Marcus never mentioned that it was a Christian event, that it was a Christian small group. Daniel just thought uh, he was coming to a party. And in fact, he wrote in a little, uh, uh, when he wrote out his testimony, how this all came to be, he actually said, he goes, man, I thought I was going to a party. And he wrote out, he said, man, I dressed, uh, man, I dressed great. I put dancing shoes on. I put the smelling good stuff on, man. I was excited to go to a party. And he walked up to the address, knocked on the door, and a, a mother opens the door. And he was kind of shocked. This is kind of strange. Somebody's mom's opening the door. And she invites him in. And he walks in. And there's like eight or nine people sitting around a table. One of them has a guitar. And he's, this is really weird. Do I need to run? And so they began to talk. And he, uh, Daniel's just looking around the room going, this is the craziest thing ever. I don't know what I'm doing here. And they maybe sang a couple songs. And then they began to pray. And each of them began to pray. And Daniel's just kind of thinking to himself, I, I don't know what to say. I, they're going to expect me to pray. I have no idea. You see, he's never had an encounter. He didn't grow up in a Christian home. He has never been exposed to the gospel. He never knew what it was. And as the prayer continued on, these words just came out of his mouth. He says, will you please pray for my grandfather who is diagnosed with cancer? And immediately that group began to pray for his grandfather who was diagnosed with cancer. And all of a sudden the group, they went on with the group and the group dismissed that night. And he walked home thinking that was the strangest thing that he'd ever been a part of. And he went home that night and a week later he gets a call from his mom. And he says, you're not going to believe this, but grandpa's cancer is gone. The cancer that they looked in on him that, um, that was going to take his life, they took x-rays and everything's negative. There is no cancer to speak of. And Daniel asked his mom, when, when did they find this out? When were the x-rays taken? And the mom said about a week ago, and Daniel found out that it was ex the, the next day after that meeting. He immediately called Marcus and said, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. And so then uh, Daniel proceeded to go to church with Marcus and that night that that in that service he raised his hand to accept Christ 
And that young man is now serving as a missionary in Thailand. And the other young man, Marcus, who made the invitation, is serving as a missionary in China. You have no idea what lives could be changed. Your story may be similar as a Christ follower. You know, we are all, uh, we are all, uh, uh, man, we're a product of somebody else's uh, faith. They brought us in. We, they told us and they shared with us. It could be a parent. It could be a grandparent. It could be a friend. Or maybe you happen to walk into a service. You have no idea what could happen by stepping out and doing what Jesus asked. Hey, come with me. Follow me. Let's go get some people to know who Christ is. It's looking back at the two men that we talked about in the book of Matthew. We're talking about Simon Peter and Andrew. You know, Peter was the guy that, um, he, was the, he was very zealous. And he was the guy that said, man, I will go to the ends of the earth for you. And if you remember anything about Peter, maybe this is the first time you're hearing this, but you see Peter kind of took a step back on the night that Jesus was, was taken into custody and he started to go through the process of what it was to go to the cross for us. He was being beaten and accused and all of these things. And Peter kind of took a little step backwards. He took a step back in Matthew 26, 58. It says, but Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. You see, he started to follow at a distance. And what tends to happen when we begin to follow at a distance, yeah, we're good, but then all of a sudden it becomes about ourselves. All of a sudden it becomes about us. And this is when, when Peter denies Jesus, when he says, look, I never knew him. The Bible even says that he cussed when they said, hey, you're one of them. You follow Christ. He goes, no, I'm not. And he cussed at him. And he says, I'm not the guy. You've got the wrong guy. He denied him. You see, the longer the distance in our following of Jesus, the more focus will be on ourselves and not the lost. But the closer we get in our following of Jesus, the more focus will be on those around us, those that don't know who Christ and not ourselves. Because the beautiful thing about Peter, you know, is that he came back. <laughs> and Peter was a huge part of the start of the church that we know as today. He came back. In fact, Jesus asked, told him that. says, hey, Peter, you know what? Satan's asked to sift you. He's asked to sift you. In fact, he's called you by name. Just know that, hey, I know you're going to blow it. But when you come back, I want you to minister to those around you. You see, that's what we're called to do. The closer we get to following Jesus, the more our focus will be on the lost and not ourselves. You know, I was, as I think about this, and I think about the incredible things that um, we hear, or the stories that we hear, I could tell you stories in planting uh, Grace Point Church, man, almost eight years ago. And people coming in and just trying to be that inviter or that person that brings people in, and just where I've seen lives changed by what the power of the gospel can do. I've heard this incredible story, and just a simple story, and, and it's actually public record. You can go. I, I heard it from a guy that said, hey, I, I wanted to do some studying on the Titanic, the ship that sank many, many, many years ago. In fact, you might remember the movie. I don't want to do the, oh, you know, whatever. But the truth is, is that there's just an incredible story that came out of this. And I thought about it when we talk about Christianity, especially following Jesus in today's world. Because there's a lot of different narratives on how we follow Christ. And when we make it about ourselves and not those around us, when Jesus said, follow me, it was to follow him, to see those come to know him and know what it is to have a relationship with the creator of our world. To have a powerful relationship. You see, I want to just tell you that the Titanic was probably at this time was the largest man-made thing uh, in, at this time in history. It was the object. It uh, again, part of the story, maybe you're not familiar, or you should, maybe you are, I don't know, but you see the story of the Titanic is, is that as it was going, as it was traveling, it hit an iceberg, and it, it broke into the chambers, and all of a sudden the boat began to sink. This massive ship that they said would never be 
Uh, it was unsinkable. There's no way that it would go down. Even there was no way. Nothing could happen to this thing. It was so massive. Well, sure enough, that night, it hit an iceberg and was headed down. And I thought this was interesting as I was listening to this story about this. It says that there were, as the lifeboats were being, uh, as people were getting to the lifeboats in that first hour that this boat was going down, that this ship was going down, people started to get into the lifeboats and they would lower them down into the ocean. And what was interesting, what was fascinating to me is that these lifeboats had a capacity to hold 70 people. They could put up to 70 people in these lifeboats. But as people were getting into them, they were lowering them with only half the people in them. They said that recorded, history records that, that a lot of these boats had only 30 people down to 12 people in them. And they could hold up to 70. And they were dropping these boats into uh, into the water. You see, there were, uh, they were half full. They had a capacity for more people, but yet they were so empty. And then, and then as they were talking about it, there were, uh, the, that as they were half full in their capacity, they had more capacity to save more people. As they looked back, they began to row away from the sinking ship. They began to row away. There were hundreds of people in the water. In fact, they refer to this as the second tragedy of the night because boats that had capacity to save people rode away from them. And as I was thinking about that and I was listening to this story, it really kind of uh, uh, made me think about, man, is that where we are? Is that what we're like in our world today as Christ followers? Are we happy because, you know what, as they're rowing away, they're like, whew, I dodged a bullet, I made it, I'm safe, I'm on this boat. Man, look at all the people that are dying in the water, but you know what, I'm good, I'm saved, I'm going to make it. You know, and it seems to represent this crazy time of Christianity, this end time Christianity. It seems like we're happy with the fact that we made it, that we know Jesus. Yet there are still hundreds in the water, and... And as I was listening to this story, as the guy began to talk about it, he goes, man, there has to be something different, right? There's got to be another narrative. That's just not how this can end. There's got to be something different about this story. There's got to be another phase to it. And the truth is that there is. There is. There was this 39-year-old evangelist. His name was John Harper. And John Harper uh, was on that boat. In fact, what he was doing is he was coming over from London. He was going to go to Chicago to be a part of a big evangelism crusade to basically preach the gospel, to preach Christ in this time period. And he's on this ship, and he's there with his daughter, his daughter Annie Jesse. And Annie Jesse, as he's there, uh, uh, um, uh, as he realizes that this boat is going down in the first hour of this thing, he grabs his young daughter, Annie Jesse, and he throws her onto a lifeboat. In fact, it's documented that she was on one of the first lifeboats lowered into the water. It's documented that as he was there, and it's documented that as the passengers on that lifeboat witnessed, uh, witnessed John Harper putting his young daughter on this, he hugged her, and he kissed her on the forehead, and he says, sweetheart, you're going to be okay. And he put her on this lifeboat into the care of others and said, hey, take care of my daughter. And he looked at her and he says, I will see you again. They witnessed this. They witnessed, there is documented of this. And he goes, I will see you sometime later. And he put his young daughter on there. And you see it's documented that she was on the passenger list of that lifeboat. But John Harper was not. Because John Harper ran back into the boat and he started pounding on cabins' doors. And he, he began to hit the doors and he started yelling out. He said, women and children and everyone who do not know Jesus, get to the lifeboats now. Get to the lifeboats now. You see, his perspective was looking at this boat going down. And he goes, man, I've got to get people on these lifeboats because if they don't know Christ, they're going to slip into eternity without knowing who he is. And he began to pound on these doors, and he's saying, women and children and everyone who do not know Jesus, get on the lifeboats now. It was perspective as he's watching boats go down, and people are getting into him. He himself easily could have jumped on one of those boats, and maybe yelling or calling out. 
And we would, nobody would have faulted him for that. We would have never held that against him. In fact, it was interesting because John Harper ended up in the water and he was one of the hundreds in the water. And as he was there, he began to realize, you know what, I'm not going to make it out of this night alive. And so his battle cry changed. His battle cry changed. And he began to say, he began to yell, believe in the Lord Jesus. And you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. He's in the water and he's yelling this. In fact, it's documented. You can look this up. It's documented that as there were cries of anguish coming from the water, you could hear a male voice above them shouting, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. (laughs) It was kind of interesting as he was calling out, there was a 19-year-old kid on this boat or that was in the water his name was William John Merrow and William John Merrow was uh, holding on to a piece of the boat and trying to uh, hold on for dear life and as he was in the water he kind of drifted towards where where John Harper was and and John Harper looked at him and it says do you know Jesus do you know Jesus and the currents kind of pulled him apart and William thought that for a moment man what an odd question what What is that about? I don't understand that. And as the current brought them back into each other, uh, John Harper yelled at him again. He says, do you know Jesus? And William said, no, sir, I don't. And he said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You see, as history records, they had a reunion a year after the Titanic went down. And they were all gathered and they were telling their stories. Well, William was saved because only one lifeboat of the many that were dropped in the water, only one went back. And John uh, and William was put on that boat. And he begins to tell the story of what I just described to you. And he said, man, as the current brought us in, man, this guy was telling me about Jesus. And he goes, I've got to tell you that I was saved twice that night. You see, what is it? It's a narrative. What is it? Are we happy being in that lifeboat? Man, I'm good. I'm good. (laughs) Right? I'm saved. Whew, I made it on it. Are we going to be like that John Harper? And we're going to go, man, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. When Jesus said, follow me, let's go after that lost sheep. Let's go after that lost coin. Let's go after that lost son, that lost daughter. You know, I, I'm challenged today. I'm challenged with this message because the truth is, is that it is about Christ and it's about being a Christ follower. Because we have the answer and it's in a loving Savior. Are we going to be like that John Harper banging on doors? Hey, and you know Jesus. Get to the lifeboats. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You see, what version of this end-time Christianity are we going to be? Are we going to be the one rowing away? Are we going to be the one, man, that's going to be running in and saying, man, we have to make a difference in this world. We are in such a crazy time right now. It really is crazy. And the answer is Jesus. So, Father, I thank you for allowing us, Lord, to be Christ followers and what that means. And when you call us to follow you, it's to follow you to say to see people come to know you in a real way. And so, Father, I pray that we be challenged today. In fact, I want to ask right where you're at. Maybe I'm talking to you. Maybe, maybe you are just, hey, you know what? I'm good. I got Jesus. I'm good. But I can do more. I can reach outside more. I can be more purposeful in what it is to see people come to Christ. And maybe that's you, and right where you're at, would you just make that commitment with me? Maybe it's just a reaffirming of your faith in Christ. And maybe that's what it's going to take, and maybe you're just like, man, I've just kind of been following at a distance, and I've all of a sudden made it about me, and I don't want it to be about me. I want to be a Christ follower. I want to go after that lost coin, that lost son, that lost daughter. I want to go after that lost sheep. Right where you're at. Father, would you help us right now, Lord? You give us a passion, Lord, that people matter to you, therefore they should matter to us. And Father God, that we would be like that John Harper, going after those 
Lord, that needs you in such a desperate way, especially in this world we're in today. In Jesus' name. Maybe today you're that lost sheep and you didn't realize it. Maybe, uh, maybe you're the one that, like the John Harper's calling out to, do you know Jesus? Do you know him? Yeah, you've heard about him. You know the stories, but do you have a relationship with him? Can I tell you that today is your day? Because I believe the word of God when he says that God sent his son for us, that we would have life. That we would have life. It's not his desire that we perish, but it's all to come know him and have what eternal life is. He brought salvation to us through his son, Jesus. And so it's just simple as that. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. If that's you today, right where you're at, you can just type in the chat, that's me, I need Christ. I need Jesus. I want to pray with you. I want you just to repeat a simple little prayer with me. It's not the prayer that saves you. Please understand that. But it's our heart saying, God, I give you it all. I give you my life. I want to have that relationship with you. I want to be a Christ follower. And so would you just simply, right where you're at, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to look for me, the one that is lost. Today, I give you my life. Today I accept your forgiveness. No longer to live for myself, but to live for you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I want to encourage you today, whether, uh, if you prayed that prayer, would you just send me an email? The email is right there on the screen. And let me know, hey, today I made a decision for Christ. Would you type that in the chat as well? Today I made a decision to follow Christ. I want to get with you. There's some resources, some things that will help you learn what it is to be a Christ follower. And I want to reach out. I want to say welcome to the family of God because the scripture that we just read earlier, all the angels in heaven rejoice when there's a soul saved. They are throwing a party in heaven for you. And so I'm excited that we could be a part of that. Would you just let me know? In fact, you know what? In a couple of weeks, we're going to do a baptism here. And baptism is one of those things that we believe in. We believe in immersion. And what baptism is, is just saying, hey, I'm going to make a public profession of what God has done in my life. It's an outward expression of an inward change. And if you want to be a part of that, let me know as well. But thanks for being a part of Grace Point this morning. Thanks so much for tuning in. Because at Grace Point Church, we want you to experience a place that you belong. I will see you next week.